Peter Owens, standing on the Kingscombe shore, seeing this red egg, seeing this boat, seeing it come together, see these figures moving out of the ocean, these silhouettes stepping out, these yellow eyes blinking, and then a number of other silhouettes moving down from Dun Manor. You seem to be hidden from all of this, but this is the culmination of so many unusual events for you, Peter Owens. Can you give me a sanity roll, please? That's a hard success, 12 over 41. Oh, you are still going to lose a point of sanity, I'm afraid. Mm. Um, flying ships, hovering red orb eggs, and seeing amphibian-like yellow-eyed creatures walk out of the ocean will do that to you, I'm afraid. Mm. But with that realisation, Mr. Owens, seeing them coming out of the water, seeing the ship, seeing the town before you now bathed in this red mist which seems to be well moving gently just twisting writhing making its way around doors and buildings and windows what do you do his first instinct as ever is just to get the hell out of there i mean he's seeing these things that he's seen a glimpse of before he's, he's seeing them rising from the sea from the sea and he he sees an already very bad situation. It's turned to something truly terrible. So he's going to he's going to get out of there. I think he's, he has some things that he's stored back at the uh, the sea chapel. His money, his belongings, and whatnot. And he's gonna he's gonna head there to pick up them before fleeing town for good. Okay, can you give me a um, spot hidden, please? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a success. Thirty three over sixty five. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's not actually too long before you get there and you're, you're walking through this red mist which is twisting these tendrils writhing around in some areas you see these pockets but there's a moment that you walk through a rather thick cloud of red mist and you feel it for a minute peter you feel it almost gently slither up your arm and over your shoulder as if it's going up to your to your face but having seen that happen you're able to just brush it off and it just dissipates into the air there's no grip there there's no resistance it just disappears and with your spot hidden you think you see a figure moving through this red mist perhaps up ahead of you but then they're gone moments later you're moving to the, the heart of the sea chapel. They, you feel like maybe they were going in that direction. But they're gone moments later, and you can see every street, every alley that you pass, that you walk down, you hear your footsteps, this eerie silence. Apart from the mist, which has this almost indescribable comforting hum as it just gently moves around the whole of Kingscombe. But it's not long before you find yourself at the door of the heart of the sea chapel. Being a very cautious man, he is going to take a little listen at the door to see if there is anyone in there or if, you know, indeed everyone is at the ball still or you can give me a listen roll then, please. Okay. I'm going to make a little roll myself. And that's a fail, 87 over 40. You do hear something with that failure. 87 over 40. You hear a door uh, opening inside the heart of the sea chapel. And you hear a voice. It's a familiar voice. It's Reverend Marsh. Almost talking, uh, just, just out loud. Oh right! No, no, I've got to. I've, I've got to find it, and and, and, I, and I've got to take um, to, to the Prudos. I've got to take it to the Prudos. Um, so I, 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 oh, I had no idea. I had no idea. Please, please forgive me. I had no idea. Uh, he's going to take the opportunity. Just he's, he's just going to go straight in. He's just going to. He's, he's not going to stealth it. He's just going to go straight in. He's going to like, Reverend Marsh. Uh, is everything okay, sir? 
you see the Reverend March, he's actually kneeling down at the altar at the, the front of the church, um, and his hands are clasped together, and he's looking up um, at the, 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 the various stained glass uh, windows, and you can see he's got tears coming down from his face. He stands up when he sees you. Oh! Peter! Oh, Peter! Oh, uh, my prayers have been answered. Peter, thank you. Oh, God, thank you. I thought you were. Thank you, Peter. Peter, I'm so sorry. I've made a terrible mistake. I've made a terrible mistake. You must help me, Peter. You must. Uh, sir, Reverend, I, I, whatever it is, I don't think we've got time to, to discuss it. I think we need to get out of this town. Oh, well, we must, Peter, because if we don't stop it, there's, there's nowhere to hide. You can't hide from them. Wherever you go, there'll, there'll be no hiding. No one will be safe. Your family won't be safe, Peter. No one will be safe. We have to help. We have to stop. Lord Hawthorne, I, I saw what he did at the ball, Peter. I, I understand his intentions now. I thought his intentions were good, were worship for Diathogua. I thought his intentions were to praise Diathogua, but he means our Lord harm, Peter. He means our Lord harm. Sir, sir, I, 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 I'm sick of all this. I'm sick of the Duns. I'm sick of the Hawthorns. We need to get out of this place. We just need to go right now. There's, there's, there's no time for debate. He'll, he'll step forward now. He's up from the floor. He'll step forward now. You're very welcome to dodge. This isn't an aggressive move. He just comes towards you and tries to put his arms, uh, sorry, his hands on your arms just to really kind of get eye to eye with you and try and communicate the seriousness of the situation. And he sees your lack of willingness to help. He sees your lack of care in these religious matters. But he grabs your arms and says, Peter, Peter. We are all in the dreams of the incipient Lord Dithogua. Lord Hawthorne means him harm. If Lord Hawthorne is able to hurt Dithogua and, and, and complete his nefarious plans, none of us are safe. We have to stop him. And, 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 and I know how. And I know how. It's Adam, you see. Adam Prido. Adam Prido, sir. And he takes a breath. If doing what you're asked, does it keep my family safe? Once it, and for all. It, Peter, if you do what I ask, you will be keeping everyone's family safe. Well, what do we need to do, sir? What do we need to do? We need to get Adam Prido's body. So just a pause, just like, do I know where that is? Oh. Oh. <laughs> as the, as the under. Yeah, that's the um, grave digger, do I? Do you know, what's really disturbing, Peter, is that you don't. You know where everybody's body is, living and dead, usually. But in this instance, you don't. Give me a history roll, would you please? Yeah, certainly. That is a success. That's 43 over 60. You remember an Adam Prido coming to Kingscombe? year or so ago you remember him staying at Prudo Manor much like these new Prudos have done they moved in uh, he was wined and dined he was quite a serious man wasn't as um, well shall we say wasn't as open and emotional as the current Prudos you don't remember him leaving you don't remember him dying you don't know where the body is so at that point, he says the, to the Reverend, he's like, but Sir, I, I I don't remember. Did he die? What, 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 where is his body? Is, is he dead? He, he, he is. Um, when he died, it was at the hands of, of you know who. But uh, we, we, I was asked to dispose of the body it, it was uh, supposedly a, an insult to what we were doing with the incipient lord uh, but I I, I, I I saw what what Adam he, he, he told me what he had found he told me he'd found a way to stop all of this and I couldn't bring myself to, to, to dispose of the body in the way they asked and, I, and you have to forgive me Peter oh you have to forgive me I thought you would forgive me I hid the body with the pages. I hid the body with the pages from everybody. Where, sir? Where did you hide them? I... I... 
I hit them. And that's when you hear another voice. I know this is. The door <laughs> to the church creaks open, and you hear a voice saying, Go on, Reverend. Tell us, where did you hide Adam Prido's body? We're all listening. The Reverend. Actually, let's have a little look at how the Reverend's doing, shall we? <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. The Reverend uh, looks over to the door, sees that Mr. Stephen Jenkins has just entered the church. I think we all know on whose orders, don't we, Lord Cosgrove? <laughs> Mr. Stephen Jenkins enters the church to collect a reverend. But as the reverend sees Jenkins, and Jenkins is looking rather different. Peter, would you like to give me a role? I'm not going to ask you for a specific role. It could be a spot hidden or even a psychology. But if you'd like to perceive something about Mr. Stephen Jenkins, I'm very happy for you to roll and maybe gain some insight. Hmm. I think with natural philosophy being my second best skill, I will go for a spot hidden. Okay. And that is a success with 52 over 65. Well, not only can you see that Mr. Stephen Jenkins has almost seems to have gotten bigger. And you saw him not too long ago on the cliffside. It's maybe his presence. It may be that in this place, the way he's walking in, you standing next to the Reverend Marsh, it may be that this is a trick of the eye, but he seems bigger, physically more demanding. You can see that there is a smear of red jelly around his lip, almost as if it's just been ignored and hasn't been wiped off. His eyes, they are a piercing crimson red, and there's almost a trail of mist pulling from each eye as he walks, and as he bobs his way into the room, you see this mist peeling from his eyes. But this smile, Peter, it's the smile with wide teeth, almost now teeth distorted and disjointed as if they'd been knocked out and re-put in. There has been a physical change to Jenkins. Oh, look who we've got here, Reverend. It's my new friend, Peter. I thought you were running away, Peter. I'm glad you stayed for a little bit more fun. Oh, sir, come on, please. What happened on the cliff? We, we, we're square. We're square. I killed that poor man. I, I did everything you asked me to. Oh, Peter. Peter. You ran away. You didn't show me the respect I deserve. Am I not a gentleman? And as he says this, there is spit and there is red like froth and foam coming out of his mouth and his eyes are wide and stretched, almost as if there, there, there is, a, there is a, um, a force driving him. And you see this rage in him and he steps closer to you and the Reverend, the Reverend now almost kind of dropping to the floor and, and holding himself, shaking and crying. You standing before and Jenkins is walking towards you, Peter. I am a gentleman. I am no different to Hawthorne and Brito. I should be treated like them. I should be treated like them. You ran away, Peter. You didn't show me the respect I deserve. What do you do, Peter? Oh, my. <laughs> uh, he's going to try and get between him and the Reverend while kind of try trying with one arm to sort of shove the Reverend to try and get him on his feet behind him. And he's, he's, he's sort of going to try and reason with him a little bit. He's going to be like, yes, sir, sir, yes, you're a gentleman. I'm not a gentleman. I don't, I don't know about, I don't know about these things. I don't know about these things. You're, you're the gentleman. I, I'm sorry I ran away. I was scared. I was scared. Just, 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 come on, please, please now. Come on. There's no need for any of this. Okay, I'm going to ask for two rolls. One is a uh, strength roll to see if you are able to pull the Reverend up off his feet and, mm -hmm. and get him ready to go. Uh, and the second is a groveling roll, a hard groveling roll, uh, which could be charm, persuade, um, whatever it is that you fancy doing there. Hmm, okay. That's a good. 
Yeah, I think actually in this case, because we're talking about, uh, you know, this idea of respect and being a gentleman, there's a, yeah, there is a level of uh, etiquette there, which clearly is what Jenkins is demanding. Hmm. Oh dear. Um, so my strength roll <laughs> was a failure of 79 over 50. My etiquette roll was a 93 of 12. So oh, a huge fail. Dear. Um... You fail to get the reverend off the floor. And the time it takes you to do that, Mr. Jenkins manages to cross between the pews and is standing right before you. Can you tell me, Peter, just as you're having that moment of etiquette and groveling and and calling Jenkins a gentleman and apologizing for your behavior, can you just describe to me what it was that you were doing and saying? So he's, he's sort of almost on his knees trying to drag the reverend up and he's saying, Sir, I, I, you're a gentleman. You're, you, you're the most gentlemanly, gentlemanly, gentlemanly man I know. Look, please, uh, uh, there's no need for this, this violence. Uh, gentlemen aren't violent. You don't need to do this right now. As you're kind of there, you know, maybe even hands up, kind of, you know, praying or, or, or warding him off, whatever it is that you're doing, Jenkins just walks towards you and very slowly he reaches out his arms and he grabs your wrists. Very slowly, very gently. There's no quick uh, predatory movement here. This is all about power. And he grabs your arms and he leans in close to your face, Peter, and says, Oh, Peter. Oh, Peter. I know exactly what you're doing. You think that I can be won over with false words. I think it's weak, Peter. I think you are weak. Let's put it to the test, shall we? No, sir, sir, no, no, please. He starts extending your arms out either side to the point where they are stretched. And then he carries on and carries on and carries on. And you feel your muscles pulling. You feel your bones stretching to the absolute limits. Can you give me, and I'm going to need here, a hard strength roll? Well, that's a failure. 64 of 50. Okay. Are you going to take pity on him and let him spend luck? I don't know if he's got that much luck, but I'm willing. <laughs> I'm willing to take pity on him. I don't think Jenkins is. Yeah, I could spend some luck. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll spend 14 points of luck to make that a... Oh, no, it's going to be a hard success. It's going to be a hard it? success. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, I, need, I need you to so get a 25. Yeah, 25. I could... I, oh, shit. I don't have enough. I don't think I've got enough. Okay. I mean, it's not the end of the world for all the other investigators. Um... Could you give me a 1d12, please? Uh, sure can. Sorry, bear with me two secs. I, I always have trouble finding the normal dice on this. 1d12 coming up. It's a nine. Um, and how many hit points do you have? <laughs> um, eight. Okay, and uh, can you just um, roll me a 1d4? We'll say odds is left, evens is right. <laughs> it's a one. Peter, your arms stretched out and this face, Mr. Jenkins's nose is almost a millimetre away from your nose. His breath stinks of this red gelatinous jelly that's pouring out. And as he's saying these words, he's almost spitting them over your face in his eyes. You can't even see the pupils anymore. They are just almost like a, like a, a snooker ball of pure red, just right in your face. As he says, weakness, Peter. As he says that, he pulls your arms, but it is your left arm that is torn from your body. And he holds you up with his other arm, your other arm, your right arm, and he holds you up in the air. And quite bizarrely, he lifts you so high that he puts his face underneath your torn off 
arm and he lets the blood from your torso just drip over him like some weird baptism of blood just raining over him. And then he just looks down at the Reverend Marsh and says, Reverend Marsh, I believe we have an occasion to get to. <laughs> Peter Owens, you are dropped to the floor. Your body slaps into your own puddle of blood as it hits the stone in the heart of the sea chapel. You hear the cries of Reverend Marsh as Mr. Jenkins picks him up and throws him over his shoulder and says, Reverend, we are going to have such fun. And he begins walking out of the heart of the sea chapel with the Reverend Marsh over his shoulder. And as your vision blurs, darkens and begins to fade. What are your last thoughts, Peter Owens? Last thoughts are his wife, Edith, and his little daughter, Lucy, and the memories that he had with them, the memories he had with Lucy and the, the book of fairy tales he used to read to her, and also a little bit of regret of the things that Jenkins made him do, how he made him stab Burroughs before he got thrown over that cliff. And he dies with that sort of bittersweet memory in his mind as he fades away. Mr. Burroughs, you yes, indeed. are in a much uh, safer environment, having uh, woken up um, underground in this tube full of water. It was a certain Mr. Piers Kinnisley who you know and you recognize from the King's Come Spa. And he had uh, released you from the tube and, and, and I believe has gotten you to swear your allegiance once again to Lord Hawthorne. He certainly has and my life for Hawthorne. passed out with those final words. Can you give me a constitution roll, please? Oh, I would love to. And uh, what was the role, please, Mr. Burrows? That was an abject failure, 85 over 35. Um, excellent. Uh, nothing happens uh, whilst you're unconscious, um, apart from when you do wake up, there's a funny taste in your mouth. Feels like maybe alcohol? Yeah. Are we talking brandy or... Uh... Like um, a preserving fluid. Give me an intelligence roll, please. Give me a no roll. Let's see. Let's see. Well, let's not forget that Mr. Burroughs has been through rather a lot recently. Uh, that's how I'm going to excuse his failure once again <laughs> of 89 over 75. It's hard to tell. You can't really place it. It's a, it's a strong alcohol and you taste it and you can almost kind of feel that the, the, the liquid is, is kind of on your face as if it's been used as a... Uh, you know, a, a momentary kind of restorative to wake you up. And uh, you begin to wake up. You begin to open your eyes and you can see the damp rock walls. From the corner of your eye, you can see one of those gigantic, large, aquarium-like tubes, rooms, tanks. But you can also hear someone moving around. In fact, you hear someone moving around, clattering a few things, you hear some papers move, you hear the tink of metal on metal, and you hear a hum. <laughs> oh, Mr. Burroughs, I see you're finally with the world of the waking. I hope you've had a pleasant dream. Is that the voice of Mr. Kinnersley I recognise? It is the voice of Mr. Kinnersley you recognise, and he's still wearing his quite lovely yellow coat uh, that everyone seems so fond of. Right. Well, I uh, I put plaster a sort of uh, grimace across my face and and prop myself up on my my right elbow because my ah, left right. arm has completely gone numb. Sorry, you don't prop yourself up on your your right <laughs> arm. You oh try no. To. Um, unfortunately, you seem rather well, rather still you can't seem to prop yourself up on your right arm okay uh do i feel perhaps uh straps of some kind any restraints ah yes you do yeah that's <laughs> that's quite unfortunate you do indeed um you you feel uh now that you move your body you feel that there's one perhaps um over your forearms and your chest 
Uh, there's one perhaps over your 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 waist and your wrists. Uh, there's one over your ankles, uh, and there's uh, one across your forehead. Lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be one of those mornings. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Kinsley, uh, is all of this really necessary? Oh, um, well, <laughs> you see, I've never really had the chance to operate before, so I wouldn't really want you moving around too much. O- operate? Ah. Uh, <laughs> I don't follow your meaning. You have nothing to worry about, Mr. Burrows. Um, I, I've seen um, um, uh, Mr. Dunn, uh, Lord Dunn, previously Dr. Dunn, uh, do this many, many times. Um, and I have his notes, um, but I know he's very busy. You presented yourself here, and with, with you swearing to give your life to Lord Hawthorne, I thought perhaps mm-hmm. uh, the methods they use on these, um, the deep ones, uh, the, you know, just the quick little... Um, fiddle up by the old brain, I believe. Um, it's, 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 he calls it a lobotomy. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> my dear sir, um, am I to understand this is an, an experimental... Uh, experimental... Pre- no, no, no. <laughs> you see, uh, Lord, 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 Lord Hawthorne uh, is expecting a, a report for myself. I've, I've, been, I've been dutifully gathering information you see but but it's it's, it's all it's all it's all notes it must be uh it must be collated it must be it must be delivered i uh, mm. i you must let me leave at once so he, he should be most displeased well i i mean i am all very nearly ready to go mr burrows it would seem a wasted opportunity i i do see that I'm most inconvenient <laughs> i'm fright, frightfully sorry for the trouble um but i you do understand i, I must i must go Oh, I think there's a persuade role here, is there? Gosh, am I any good at persuading? I forget. Let's find out. Not really. It's only if there a was 30. a time to try. What well, fast talk might also work. Ooh. That's true. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, I've got a 65 in fast talk. But you can't law your way out of this one, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> what? You mean I can't remind him that what he's attempting is illegal? <laughs> <laughs> I think he knows. Ah, oh, curses. Well, let's try this fast talk then. Finally, the gods are with me. That is a hard success. 16 under 65. Just remind me, what is it that you say to to fast talk um, Kinnersley into this uh, this realization that perhaps you should be somewhere else under under Hawthorne's watch? I'm trying to convince him that I'm due to deliver a report, that I've been gathering information for Hawthorne, mm. um, and that I have a lot of it rattling around in my brain and in notes and things, and that he's expecting me. I'm trying to sort of amp up my um, my importance to Hawthorne a little bit. I'm not just a, a random pawn to be lobotomized. Um, I'm actually already in his employ. Right. Well, as, as you're doing that, and that, that conversation, you know, that, that fast talk, that description, that you know, takes it takes a minute or so of of Burroughs is is quite respectable, um, simpering and babbling. And during that time. Kinnersley is is leaning over you. He you can you can actually feel him parting your hair, uh, and and he's got some kind of small uh, um, marker. Seems like there's some kind of uh, perhaps um, chalk or something, and he's, he seems to be drawing a line uh, from your skull from the top of your forehead right back through your hair where he's parted. And uh, just as he's he's kind of getting to the point where he pulls out a, a razor to to start shaving the hair, you almost feel the first kind of just a little flick there at the front where he's just taken off the first little bit of hair. He hears you say, Lord Hawthorne wants me. I need to deliver these reports. I need to speak to him. I am not um, fair game to be lobotomized. And in that moment, oh, oh, well, that is a pity, isn't it? Oh, well, blast and dash it. I have to say, I was very much looking forward to giving it a go. Quite so. Yes, I, as I say, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I just, oh, drat it. Uh, these Mr. things do happen. Mr. Burrows, I, I understand you have prior commitments. Are you sure I can't convince you to go through with this? It would be it would be quite remarkable. I mean, I, I, I believe it. And believe me, I'd, I'd like nothing more than and perhaps to, to witness the procedure on, on some other occasion. But I know I assure you I'm, I'm, I'm quite spoken for, I'm afraid. Hmm. Well, perhaps, uh, perhaps you might find someone who would make a suitable, um, well, 
little uh, little game, shall we say? Uh, by, so, uh, yeah, uh, but of course, uh, with, with, with Lord Hawthorne's permission, uh, naturally, I'm, I'm certain uh, accommodations can be made. Uh, hmm. Right, very good then. Well, I suppose I'd better let you up. Um, hold on one second. Uh, and as you feel each of the straps being undone, there is just this immense feeling of, of relief, of this pressure, literal and emotional, uh, being released from you as these straps are undone and this pressure is taken from you. Uh, and you find yourself, you are underground. You are in the aquarium. You can see these interconnected tanks across the room. What is it you do, Mr. Burrows? Well, firstly, I try to I try to sit upright as <laughs> as genteelly as possible, but my left arm gives way under my <laughs> sliced collarbone, and I uh, I fall off the table. And oh. then, as I <laughs> as I gather myself and try and dust myself off, I have a look around. I believe I saw two tanks, one with these horrible creatures. He's called them deep ones. Um, emerging with those rods in their brains, and the other tank contains some strange red orb, um, something stretching in the middle of it. So I'm really curious about that. Well, now you're conscious and time has passed. The scene has changed, Mr. Burroughs. Oh, no. Red orb. The red orb has gone. Damn it. It's no longer there. There is this central tank which you believe you saw the red orb in there is a eastern tank which has this uh, almost um black oil all writhing around the bottom of the tank from where you're standing um to see any further than that though mr burrows i'm gonna need a spot hit regular success that is 25 under 40. well no one is hiding anything from you and you can uh, you know move around the the room as best uh, you see fit um the even though there are the pipes the tubes connecting these larger tanks together uh, you are able to kind of move under them duck around them you're able to get around the room so you see the you see the tube that you came in through there is a tube that leads out to the beach, to the area you remember where you caddied for everybody when they played Pal Mal. The central tube, uh, tank that the tube connects to, is where the red egg was. And then an eastern tank with this black oil. On the far side, on the western tank, where you saw these uh, these deep ones, these, these, these fish-like humanoids with metal rods in their head, they are now gone. But in their place, there is... There is a deep one, but it's not behaving in the same way as the others, and it doesn't have metal rods in its head. It is scratching at the tank, and it is banging on the tank. Apparently, it has yet to be evolved into its more docile version. There is a, a tank, a northern tank, but it's hard to see uh, from where you are here without actually going up and having a look. I suppose I sort of try to take on the air of somebody who, uh, you know, there's been a been a laughable, unfortunate misunderstanding. Um, obviously, I came in by a rather unusual route, perhaps. Um, but I'm a fellow, you know, I, I also work for Lord Hawthorne, and there's no reason why I shouldn't know about this little operation. So he tries to sort of draw himself up as though he's, he's supposed to be here, really. And, and why shouldn't he ask a few questions? Um, and I, I stroll over and take a look at this northern tank. When you get to the tank, you can see that, again, like the others, it has a tube that connects to the, the central tank where the red egg was. Uh, and when you get to the northern tank, you can see that there is a god-awful abomination. The tank is full of water. There is this mound of bones and flesh and faces and legs and skulls, all fused into this one mound of dead flesh and bone. So the thing appears to be quite dead. It's not uh, moving around, moaning, anything like that. It appears to be a collection of dead things, but they seem to be fused together as if anything of value or, well, I think we'll need a roll for this. Let's have a... Could you give us a natural philosophy, please? Let me see here. With a lovely 10 points. Yes, I'm coming in at 60 over 10, I'm afraid. Failure. 
So d- d- you're staring at this mound of rotted flesh and bone, and even though it looks like it's lots of different individuals, you can see that they're all fused together. And then all of a sudden, Kinnersley seems to be standing right at your side, looking into the tank. Huh. Shame, eh? Lots of potential. Oh, terribly. Ha <laughs> ha. Terribly. Ha, uh, this is the, um, uh, this is where you put the, the, the offcuts? Oh, yeah, quite right. <laughs> Wouldn't call them that myself, but, uh, yes, yes, this is, uh, for all those that failed, uh, in previous rituals. Well, I mean, waste not what not. <laughs> the incipient lord needs to be fed, does it not? Fed? Oh, to be sure, to be sure. And I'm I'm staring at this horrific mound of flesh, and I'm just trying to see, fused how? Do we mean surgically? Am I seeing a load of stitches? Or like the flesh has just melted? It's... Imagine flesh grafted onto bone that's not its. You've got skulls with jaws hanging, but the bone of a, a leg or a hand is also fused into it, so they look like that they were originally part of the same structure, but clearly not and as you look at it even with your failed natural roll you can see that these are human remains lovely okay so wide eyes and uh Burris is just muttering nothing unusual nothing unusual um so tell me uh mr kinnisley <laughs> fascinating work you're doing down here um Past, past rituals, you say? Um, what matter is that? Do, do, do forgive me, I'm not, I'm not a man of uh, natural philosophy. Oh, um, I'm more than happy to, to, to tell you. Um, perhaps I'll tell you on the way out, as um, I, I need to get back and, and, and you need to give me a sanity roll. <laughs> I was wondering when that was going to show up. Well, you know, blessed be, his sanity's down to 35, but that was a 31. Oh, wow. Well, you have, let's be honest, you know, you woke up on a table about to be operated on. You talked your way out of it. uh, And this is all after having been stabbed, thrown off a cliff, washed into a tube and found by a rather dashing young man in a yellow coat. So I feel that previous sanity rolls may have brought you to the brink. And right now you're still processing. So we'll, um, we'll look forward to chipping away at that later, shall we? We certainly shall. Oh, Burroughs could use a drink. Uh, well, Kinnersley says, uh, look, um, I've got to get back to the spa. Um, wouldn't want to not be there uh, if uh, if uh, the top brass were to come around and demand certain um, <laughs> experiences. So um, you say you need to see Lord Hawthorne. Would you like to come with me or are you happy to take one of the lakes? One of the... Uh... The, the the lakes? Does he sort of point to anything as he says this or incline his head? Nope. Um, then I just sort of nod to myself. Um, no, <laughs> um, uh, no lakes for me. I'll, I'll follow you out. Um, I'd best, I'd best uh, tidy myself up a little before I <laughs> turn in my report. Goodness me, I'm, 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 I'm all over the place. Yes, uh, well, I'm sure we have a, a change of clothes for you at the, the spa if you, if you require, Mr. Burrows. That would be, um, yes, most appreciated. Uh, Burroughs realises he doesn't really have anywhere safer to go at the moment. He doesn't really want to hang around with Kinnersley, but where else to go? No, nope, we're in it now. Yep, to the spa. Excellent. Well, come with me, old chap. We'll have you cleaned up in a jiffy. Reverend Cosgrove and Thomas. I believe we last left you in the Prido study, uh, where one of you, and we won't name names, Thomas, was talking about being able to see dead people, and the other two of you were trying to put some of the pieces together. The Reverend will be having Thomas open the page of the book and reading a little bit more about Matthew Prido's diary and bringing Lord Cosgrove up to speed about quite how these people are as old as they say they are. Lord Cosgrove, you're handed this rather old-looking uh, tome of sorts, and on it, engraved in, in this gold uh, uh, lettering, is the diary 
of Second Lieutenant Lord Matthew Prido. 4th of September 1709, part of the Sea Church. Elias was adamant to make sure that the Church of Kings come quickly recognize the miracles brought home by the three of us. Still secret to the town, but revealed to those in society that could properly benefit and benefit us properly. Within weeks, the resident reverend of Kings can happily revoked the Christian Holy Trinity and accepted the blessings of the incipient God. This being the name we bestowed upon the sleeping creature to further help indoctrinate the masses of Kingscom with the teachings of the other Holy Trinity, Mother Hydra, Father Dagon, and the great old one, Cthulhu. He was the first to accept the communion of the incipient God. Communion began in earnest with the whole town, when each person would take the body of the unborn Lord, being a slither of the egg sac, and the blood of the unborn Lord, being a glass of amniotic fluid. This allowed the Kingscom community to remain unseasonably healthy, and in return, forgotten peasants and wayward folk are offered to the incipient God by the church, as they give themselves to God. In truth, they are being given to the egg, and absorbed by the gelatin-like flesh to be the unborn Lord inside. I must confess, this is something I have observed with much intrigue, and I feel that I am learning forbidden and forgotten knowledge on a daily basis. With each feeding, Elias's Jonathan's and my own power grows, as if we three, blessed by Mother Hydra herself upon the sinking of the HMS Devonshire, are beneficiaries of the unborn Lord's mystic influence. It is with the knowledge of the bountiful waters and the healing properties, the incipient God emanates into the local marine environment, that the decision has been made to construct the King's Come Spa directly above the unborn Lord. The spa will have no equal and will truly boast of healing waters. See, very disturbing there. You say uh, they asked you for some sort of baptism. See, see what lies ahead. I mean, um, uh, uh, Thomas, can you profess to what this jelly-like gifts gives you? Were you force-fed some of this? I was say? forced, yes, by Jenkins. But it's it, it's wonderful. The, the feeling of euphoria, the feeling of power you get from the, the jelly. And it's terrible. The, 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 the harrowing feeling that you get when you stop the influence, when you're out of the influence. I can see why they have been continuing with this jelly. I can see why the communion takes the slither of the egg. But the amniotic fluid, I never had any of that. If one can only dread what happens if you combine the two. Thomas, can you give me a power roll, please? indeed. That is a 31 under 45. That's a regular success. You shiver when you talk about this uh, red gelatin, this substance, and the promise of, wow, what about the amniotic fluid? You wonder what that could do for you. But this shiver does ripple through you and remind you it is... The addicts tell you have tasted this and just talking about it makes you want to taste it again. Thomas licks his lip. But a voice, a voice distracts you from somewhere in the room. Find me. Find me. Thomas turns round and says, I will, father. Uh, um, I will. I'm sorry, Master Thomas. You couldn't hear him. The father was just talking to me. A father was just talking to you. Adam was just to. Hey, we do have to excuse us, Lord Cosgrove. Um, uh, I, no, no, no. This is quite fascinating. What was your father saying? He well. Thomas looks at Cosgrove in a. What do you care about my father? But being a polite gentleman, after having already challenged him to a duel, which has been declined. He's telling me to find him. Father is here somewhere. Well, well, yes, of course, Thomas. This is the whole reason we came down to Kingscombe, is to find your father, my brother. You remember he disappeared. He disappeared, Lord Cosgrove, about, uh, just over a year ago. It's a uh, New Year's celebration. We, we haven't seen him since, and, well, I was kind of hoping to find him here. And how much looking have I'm we done? Here. Uncle. 
Yeah. Where, father? Where are you? Oh, sorry, tell, tell me. Us, who are you talking to? Please. Well, who the me devil up. do you think I'm talking to? Oh, goodness me. Reverend, let's indulge the young man. If this evening has taught us anything, it's that there are improbable things afoot in Kingscombe. And maybe, maybe, young Master Thomas has a lively imagination and is feeling the stress of the evening and a lack of sleep and, um, I'm sure, certain other pressures. Or, or maybe he is in the spirit of his dead father. Either way, I think we have nothing to lose by indulging. Very well, Lord Cosgrove. Why not? It does seem to be the flavour of... Well, Good grief, the entire visit here. Uh, Thomas, do, do, do go on. So, um, uh, Adam is with us, I is he? Uh, perhaps you could tell me how many fingers I'm holding up behind my back. Three. Three. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, my goodness me. Uh, Adam, is, is that you? Reverend Cosgrove, can you give me a power roll, please? Uh... Probably not, but we'll try. Oh, no, that is a hard success. 13 under 45. The Reverend scores a 95 versus 60. That's a failure. Oh, you hear different things. Cosgrove, when the Reverend holds his fingers behind his back and says, well, could Adam perhaps tell me how many fingers I'm holding up? You hear the very faint voice saying, three. Reverend, you don't hear that voice. You hear a different voice. Anastasia, you are standing in a void, in darkness. Your feet appear to be walking on the surface of water. What do you do or say? I am in a void walking on water and there's no one around absolutely not it appears that the water is almost pitch black and every direction you look in even though there's no light it just goes on forever you can see yourself you can see your hands you can see the immediate water next to you but there doesn't appear to be any light source you are just in this void uh, perhaps this is uh, some sort of a dream if I concentrate, maybe I will find my way back. She kind of... Reverend, you hear that voice. You hear that voice. Ooh. Miss Anastasia? Anastasia, you hear that voice. But also Cosgrave and Thomas, you hear the Reverend just saying, Miss Anastasia? Uncle, are you there? I, 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 I believe I am. Uh, where, where, where are you? We're, we're, we're a proto man. Uh, oh my goodness, Anastasia. Uh, uh, are you dead? I I don't think so, but I I don't know where I am. I, I can't I can't see. I'm I'm somewhere else. May, maybe in a dream. A dream? Uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, um, d describe what what can you see around you? Uh, 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 Cosgrove, uh, 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 Lord Thomas, I believe I'm speaking to Anastasia. Oh, 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 what what do you see, dear? Uh, nothing. Um, I think, well, I uh, appear to be standing on some form of liquid water, but all around me is, is nothing. Make us a spot hidden, please, Anastasia. A success of 44 over 49. You can see two things in this void, one of which is Charlotte, who appears to be sitting at a table reading paper in her hand. The other is a little bit further away. It's this lady in a white dress. Looks like the dress is, 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 is wet, but she, she has her hands over her face, as if she might be crying. Almost in the other direction to Charlotte she is. Mm. What, what do you see, Anastasia? Wait, um... Uh, Charlotte? I, I think I can, I can see Charlotte. Charlotte! Uh, Sh Charlotte's upstairs. Charlotte, what are you doing in your room, Charlotte? 
So Charlotte has not had a very good evening, has she really? She's uh, woken up in the middle of the night to find her dead husband having some sort of night terror slash panic attack. uh, And he's attacked her, thinking that she's some kind of, well, doesn't even know what, what, what he thinks that she is. And then, of course, he just ran at the wall trying to, I don't know, wake himself up or something and promptly knocked himself on the head and um, Charlotte thinks this serves him right to be honest that's her first uh, kind of instinct there so if is Philippe still there or has he kind of gone as he has wont to do Philippe is on the floor he can see that he's upset you and you you've pushed away from him he's at the other side of the room almost knees to his chest looking at you with tears in his eyes and he can see that you've you've taken yourself to the desk he doesn't seem to be talking or he he seems his mouth is moving but no words seem to be coming out She doesn't think she can even look at him right now, to be honest. So she's going to very deliberately sit at her desk with her back to him and um, go back to the book that she was trying to read, or rather the, uh, the manuscript rather than the book. Anastasia, as you see Charlotte sitting at her desk as she begins to read, you hear everything she's saying. But what's incredibly, incredibly unique in this moment, Reverend, you hear Charlotte's voice in the same way that you can hear Anastasia's voice. Charlotte, please. Screams from Jonas's room were heard throughout the street. Some people came and knocked on the door, but only to tell him to be quiet. None cared enough to check his condition, None cared enough to call for a doctor. Jonas, even in his moment of suffering and rebirth, found that he was an inconvenience to those who looked down upon him. The pressure in and on his head grew, his vision blurred. All he could taste was the tang of metal, and yet he stood still throughout, embracing his newfound self. The voice of the reflection trickled into Jonas's ear. Stare into the deep, let it in, let it seep, whispered words crawling inside his mind. An image comes into clarity, one of a red ocean, the waves crashing into each other with such ferocity, wave after wave exploding into each other. But then among the waves, Jonah sees something, something indescribable. His mind almost shattered at the sight of the unnatural, mocking a mere mountain with its size. The creature's writhing tentacles slapped into the waves, its arms bursting from the deep, surfacing as if the waters were at its very mercy. Finally, as the water spray settled and the red ocean calmed to the stillness of a bowl of water used to wash one's face, the monster stared at Jonas with an ancient knowledge and primordial authority. Its gigantic yellow eyes unblinking in their invasion, finally speaking to Jonas without words. It told him things he should not know. It told him things no one should know. But Jonas listened all the same, until he could listen no more. Anastasia, you see Charlotte sitting at a chair reading and reading and reading, not responding to your call. Reverend, you hear Anastasia, but you hear Charlotte in the back as this. But in front of you is Cosgrove and is Thomas. What are you all doing? Uh, Anastasia, um, we, we're going to try, try and uh, find you. Uh, just keep talking and... and uh, uh, Oh, Thomas, what, what, what do we do? You, you've spoken to the dead before. I don't think Anastasia is, is dead. Thank God, Charlotte can't hear me. But, and there's someone else here as well. Oh, uh, uh, who, who, who? Please, de- please describe this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Anastasia's going to start making her way towards the other lady. She's crying, I think. Uh, a woman is crying. <laughs> a crying woman. <laughs> 
Uncle? Uh, 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 yes, yes, that was a crying woman. Are her hands at her face? Uh, Anastasia, are uh, her hands at her fa- hands at her face? Uh, they are. Uh, yes, no, they are, they are. Anastasia, you hear uh, a little mumbling voice underneath it, this crying. Um, it, it's it's hard to hear without getting closer. It's hard. To, in fact, do you want to give me a listen roll? Let's do it. That is a failure. Forty-five over forty. Oh, you can't quite hear, but you know she's saying something. And every time you you take a step closer, it's, it's the slightly more clarity. Um, I, I suppose I'd say if if you do get a bit closer, I'd give you a bonus die on another listen roll. Sorry, Thomas. What did you say? Sure. <laughs> The, the lady. The lady, if, yes. If she, if she is in the same dream I was. Right. Oh, Thomas seems to recognise the lady, Anastasia. The lady is... Uh, I don't know. And can Anastasia... Can, can you hear me? Anastasia, can you hear me? No, I don't um, think she is. She can only hear me, Thomas. Uncle, tell her it's mother. Oh, it's your and mother. Not, it's not your mother. Look, oh, mother. isn't do that not, delightful? Do not look at her face. And as you oh, hear those words... But don't look... <laughs> what, what, Thomas? As you hear those words, Anastasia, and you step closer to hear what's being said. You rolled a bonus die, did you not, Anastasia? Uh, I rolled exactly the same thing with the bonus die. Oh, you don't hear what she's saying, but as you get closer, her hands quickly dart away from her face, and you see... Horror, Anastasia. This is your mother. You don't remember her for the age that you were, but you've seen pictures and this is her. And she was beautiful. She was beautiful, Anastasia, because you're looking at a rotten, water-filled, sagging flesh that's dripping and sloughing off the bone, eyes half rotten but still staring. And she looks at you and smiles and says, You are like me! And then she jumps at you, Anastasia. Thank you for joining us for Cult and Culpability. Remember, you can find us at www.miskatonicplayhouse.com and you can also visit the main stage for other scenarios from the Miskatonic Playhouse with links in the show notes below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and support us on Coffee. That's ko-fi.com forward slash Miskatonic Playhouse where you can access exclusive shows and content for as little as one pound. But if you can spare a minute to leave a review, it makes a huge difference to other like-minded listeners who will be able to find and enjoy our work. Until next time, when the curtain rises again.